tonight I'm very pleased to announce that a, a speaker that I've had here several times before uh, is Rick Lohr, because since Rick retired, he's been doing a lot of traveling. I think he did some before that, but he was also busy teaching then at Wausau West and a little bit at Newman. He was running a golf course and a few other things. But he's a, a wonderful explorer, especially in the southeastern Asia part of, uh, of our world. Um, and tonight he's going to talk to us about Bhutan. And he was traveling the land with the Bhutan crane. It's a small country uh, between India and China and ranges from the foothills of the Himalayas in the south to the mountains in the north. And three quarters of the country is virgin wilderness. So in November of 2011, Rick traveled there um, with the International Crane Foundation. The group attended a black-necked crane festival as well as a guided tour of the country. And I'm going to let him tell you more of the details about that whole trip. I give to you Rick Lohr. Welcome, Rick. Thanks. Thank you. Well, it's kind of a trip to a magical kingdom because it has been open to travelers for very long. And it was 2011, and you can see the Himalaya Mountains in the background. And uh, let's take a trip there. Bhutan has a population of almost 800,000 people. As you can see, it's kind of sandwiched between China and India. Uh, the capital is Thimphu, and uh, it uh, has barely 100,000 people. It was closed to outsiders uh, until 1960, and no tourists were allowed until 1972. And that's what I mean. It's kind of a magical place where uh, people were not allowed uh, until very, very recently. And uh, it's uh, found itself now in kind of a strategic location. Uh, here we can see that uh, uh, it's near Assam, here's India, and here's East India. And uh, uh, it's, here's China. And just recently, uh, it's, China has a dis land dispute with Bhutan right in this area. And just recently, China started building a road through part of Bhutan that it, it claimed. And that road was aimed right at this strategic pass right here where India and East uh, India uh, to connect. And so India rushed some troops there to stop the Chinese. And so we had one country of a billion people facing off another country with a billion people. And what were we doing? We were watching tweets between, you know, a president. And here was this, this one country facing another, uh, both people with a billion people and we weren't paying attention to it at all. China finally backed down, temporarily at least. Uh, and uh, uh, China was offering a different part of Bhutan uh, to, you know, in compensation for this little place here. But this was a valley that aimed right at this strategic location. And uh, uh, my goodness, you know, we didn't even notice that in our newspapers. Uh, when we came to... Uh, uh, to Bhutan, we came in on the eastern part of it here through Assam. And most tourists don't do that because the roads in eastern Bhutan are really, uh, as the tourist magazines say, dangerous. And uh, most people come in on the other side by Thimphu on, on this side. And uh, so we, we landed, we, we took off from uh, Bangkok and we landed in Assam. And... Uh, our, our air-conditioned vans weren't there. We had some really old, dusty Jeeps. And we got in and it was sat next to the spare tires. And, and George Archibald, the head of the uh, Crane Foundation, said, what is this? And they said, well, uh, a couple of years ago, the Assam United Liberation Front of Assam uh, was trying to fight the independence movement against India and they fled uh, the Indian army into Bhutan. And the Bhutanese for a while welcomed them. But then the Indian government said, no, you must chase them out. So the fourth uh, uh, Bhutanese, uh, King Wangchuk of uh, Bhutan, uh, organized the army and chased them out. And uh, because of that, 
uh, the United Liberation Front of Bhutan, whenever they see a Bhutanese uh, license plate on a vehicle, they're likely to take a pot shot or worse at, the, at that vehicle. So those uh, air-conditioned vans that we were supposed to be in uh, didn't dare come into Assam to pick us up from the airport. So we, we drove in those older vehicles to get up into, into this area. So uh, uh, the perfect little kingdom, maybe not, you know, this part. Bhutan, India, and Nepal are home of the Himalaya mountain range. The highest peak in Bhutan is over uh, 24,000 feet. So the Himalayas are there. By the way, uh, this ranges from, this is uh, Bangladesh is basically a floodplain, very low. And you go through uh, this part of Assam, it's also low. And you go from flat tropical plain to the foot, foothills up into the mountains. So the uh, Bay of Bengal, uh, humid breezes come up here. They rise into the mountains, so you get a lot of rainfall and storms that go into the, uh, uh, the, into the mountains, and so you get a lot of rainforest, and uh, you get a lot of heat and humidity, and then as it raises up into those mountains, so you get, you get rainforest, you get, uh, and then as you drive up, up the mountains, you can get up into, into almost Arctic uh, conditions when you get high into the mountains, yes. No, there, well, there is in Thimpu on the other side. Uh, if, but our, uh, our crane uh, festival we were going to was uh, over on this side. So uh, we were going to transverse the country all the way from west to east. Most people just stay on the other side of, of, uh, of Bhutan. So here I am, that proves I was there, okay? Although you can shop, Photoshop yourself anywhere. The official language uh, is Zongka, and uh, if you did uh, Bhutan in the original language, it means land of the thunder dragon, so you know there are storms there. Rivers run south of the Himalayas into the Ganges and Brahmaputra, <clears throat> so it, uh, rivers that originate in the Bhutan area affect roughly one billion people. <clears throat> and you can see some of the beauty of the, uh, the land here. This is the fifth king, uh, King Jigmi Kassan. Uh, he had just gotten married. He is the official head of state, but uh, the uh, uh, government had, the fourth king had resigned in 2008 and made it that the king would be just the, the head of state, not the head of government. I took this picture off of a poster. I did not see uh, this king and queen, but they're quite a handsome couple. And uh, uh, so they had just gotten married. Bhutan's kings, the fourth King Wanchuk declared his priorities for Bhutan would be to make it a democratic state. So they have a, a parliament and uh, the king is just the head of state. So he would greet uh, you know, visitors to the country and so forth. But there is a prime minister that, uh, that uh, governs over the uh, uh, the country and the uh, sacred duty of the country was kadu or the welfare of the people. So he kind of set the, uh, the tone for the government. And you maybe heard of this. This is the country of the gross national happiness. This is their, their goal. And you can see up ahead, wish you a happy journey. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, this, you know, this is our guide and he's laughing. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, this is the fourth uh, king, uh, Wangchuk. The four pillars of Gross Happiness, Happiness Index are good governance. It means honesty and, and no corruption, sustainable development, cultural preservation, and environmental conservation. <clears throat> and uh, uh, if you do those four things, the people will uh, have a, a pleasant government, they will be, uh, they will be happy. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the basis for measuring uh, the gross happiness index. And uh, uh, just uh, Prime Minister Jingli just uh, was voted out of office. Uh, the, the new Prime Minister said he was spent much too money, much money running around the world selling this idea 
so much money, in fact, that they couldn't uh, enforce uh, these four pillars. And so he's, uh, he's saying we, uh, we've spent too much money doing this, and, and uh, uh, so he's going to try to, uh, to uh, enforce these back home by, uh, by saving money instead of, uh, uh, to, instead of uh, go, you know, it's going around the world trying to say that they have gross happiness index at home. Bhutan is a Buddhist country. The Dalai Lama is revered. <coughs> the, uh, the same, uh, the same uh, Buddhist uh, priest that spread uh, Buddhism to Tibet stopped in Bhutan first. So life, uh, they live a life of harmony with nature. However, before we get too uh, enthusiastic about Bhutan, excuse me here. In 1990s, uh, the Nepalese who were living in Bhutan, who insisted on keeping their Nepalese language and, and culture were forced out. That was one sixth of the population uh, that was uh, ethnic cleansing, and they were uh, put in uh, uh, camps in uh, Nepal. And uh, many of them uh, have come to the U.S. to be settled, many of them in Ohio, <clears throat> especially in Akron. And so uh, they have gone through an ethnic cleansing, and by population, the, uh, the highest percentage of population that has been forced out of any country anywhere in the world and uh, it was not, uh, uh, you know, a lot of killing involved, but it wasn't gentle either. So when we got to the Bhutanese border, here we are. Uh, this is the foreigner's checkpoint. We stopped, and it was almost like Harry Potter. Uh, we stopped, and there was this little, uh, like a uh, two or three holer outhouse. It was very small, a little wood building, and there was a, a little uh, desk in there, and there was a uh, there was a chair, and there's two chairs for people to, to sit in, and nobody was there. So we went over, and we knocked on a farmhouse, and this little guy got out, and he brought in a little satchel, and he had a stamp pad and a stamp, and he came walking out, and he sat down, and he opened his satchel, and he had one sheet of paper, and he put it down. It had our names and numbers there, and so he stamped all our uh, passports, and uh, then he uh, went back to eat supper, and uh, we were in the country. It's amazing. Uh, there is no t uh, television until 1999. There are no plastic bags allowed by law. There's no tobacco products allowed by law. Uh, and the 19, or 2013 law is that they aim to be 100% organic farming nation. Uh, that's being enforced. Uh, one of the... Uh, uh, road signs I saw, caution, narrow road, drive slowly, and I don't know if you can see the cliff with all the rocks falling off. <clears throat> and I didn't know if they were kidding, but you see the curve up ahead. And our driver thought he was kidding because he wasn't driving real slow. And this side said, road sinking ahead, drive slow. <laughs> and uh, this, this, was, uh, this is the kind of uh, driving that we had. And... Uh, you can see the kind of the wet conditions and the truck. And we're not dry slowing down, really. And uh, you wonder how far down it is. Well, this is about how far down it is. And uh, it's when they were building this road, over 300 workers were killed. Uh, these were not Bhutanese. These were Nepalese and Indians who built the road. Nepali Bhutanese don't uh, build roads. And if you look at the trucks uh, above the headlights, they have eyes. And up on the top, they have Buddhas and, uh, and stupas, so you don't have to worry. And Bhutan is the home of the Tour of the Dragon, 166.5 mile road race. It has four mountain passes ranging in height from 4,000 feet to 11,000 feet. Uh, to the last one that I read, there was uh, about 140 racers. 40 of them finished. 
It's the most difficult bicycle race on earth. Uh, by the way, the fourth king, Wanchuk, is a bicycle fanatic. And he's out almost every day on the, uh, on the roads, bicycling all the time. And because of him, uh, many, many of the Bhutanese uh, are bicyclists. Migrant women, road workers, uh, they are the poorest sector of the population. And everywhere you went, there were piles of gravel and, and rocks. And there were women fixing the roads. Uh, that's their power tool right there. Uh, that shovel, uh, that's the way it was. And prayer flags up on the, uh, the uh, tops of the mountains, and they flapped uh, in the breeze, sending their prayers for a safe descent. And little eyes of the little girl, I don't know if you can see her, underneath. It's kind of cute. But uh, uh, we started hanging prayer flags ourselves. So 52% of uh, Bhutan's land is managed and protected. Over 70% is forested. There are over 700 bird species, you can imagine. 84% uh, of the, uh, the birds are in the forest areas. This is rainforest areas. Uh, 165 man mammal species. This is like, a, you know, you're like going into a, a big uh, animal preserve. Uh, the Buddhists respect all living things and the progressive government approach to development. Uh, they don't allow people to just come in and develop anywhere. And so this is really, uh, really a, a progressive kind of natural environment for, uh, uh, for a place to, to travel. If you want to see nature, Bhutan is the place to go. Thimphu is the capital city. Uh, population is, is grown a little bit. I think we showed 100,000 before. Uh, this is a little older uh, uh, figure here. This is the only monitored intersection in Bhutan. Uh, they had stoplights at one time. They tore them out. Now they have a policeman that, uh, that directs traffic here. Uh, you may not be aware, but there was a real uh, competition to produce a $3,000 car and uh, that uh, was going on a couple of years ago. The Tata Motors of India uh, won it with a $2,500 car. And if you're wondering uh, who's going to be selling cars in all the third world countries, uh, it's, this is uh, one that has a 40 horsepower engine. And uh, we saw quite a few of these. It's, got, it's a four-door. Not a big trunk. So no level ground, you're always going up or you're going down in uh, Bhutan, as you would think. So it's, uh, you're usually at quite a altitude, so it's, uh, it was pretty rugged. Rainforest on the southern slopes of the Himalayas, so wet monsoons come from the south. Monsoons, of course, are winds, and when they pick up uh, moisture off of the Bay of Bengal, it brings a lot of uh, rainfall as it uh, as those winds uh, rise into the foothills and up into the Himalayas, it drops a lot of rainfall. Whoops. Lots of fast running streams. And uh, it's good for your balance. Bridges are f uh, for cars are few and far between. Uh, this was uh, said to be the second longest suspension bridge uh, for walking bridge in the world at the time. I just uh, heard about a, the new longest one was uh, put up someplace, so I think this is at least third or fourth now. Uh, in Marathon City, I don't know if you're aware, but we have a nice one across the rib uh, in Marathon City, which is about the 1,230th longest one. <laughs> but you can go and experience that one if you'd like. The rivers cut uh, deep valleys, and the fast-flowing water provides plenty of hydroelectricity. And you can see the roads snaking along the river down below. And India is promoting big hydroelectric dam products in, in Bhutan. And that's uh, causing concern for the rivers, because uh, uh, in damming those rivers up, uh, the, it's ruining some of the habitat for the cranes, for the... Uh, for the herons, for other kinds of wildlife. Uh, it's also a debt trap for some of the, uh, 
uh, for the Indians, or for the Bhutanese, because they owe a lot of money then to the Indian bankers. And there's a lot of resentment growing toward the Indians. Uh, it's, uh, India, it's, they, Bhutan exists at the pleasure of India, basically. Uh, and yet, a lot of Bhutanese are looking at the Chinese who are dangling a lot of products and saying, well, you know, if, uh, if you would favor us on some of these deals, uh, we'll give you a better deal than the Indians. And uh, uh, so they're beginning to feel torn between the two sides. And uh, some of the Bhutanese are saying, we feel like the meat in between the, you know, the two slices of bread in a sandwich between, uh, between India and China. Bhutan is self-sufficient in food production. Rice in low areas, barley is the basic one, the higher elevations, but you see maize, you see wheat, other kinds of produ uh, food production. But beautiful, uh, you can see some of the rice fields here. Uh, very little uh, mechanization, you can see the, uh, uh, they're taking in the rice by hand. Uh, and again, you see the rivers flowing south, so east-west travel is difficult in Bhutan. And here the person's got the rice sheaths uh, over his head and he's beating the rice on the plastic sheet, uh, not beating the rice from the kernels from the stalks. And if you like your food hot, red uh, and uh, green, uh, peppers are uh, plentiful and I like my food hot, so I had no problem in Bhutan uh, because we had uh, plenty of spicy food, although uh, they took pity on most of the members of the group, and uh, you could add the spices if you wanted. 170 pound loads of, uh, of, uh, that they were carrying, I th I'm not sure exactly what was in the uh, bags, but they did say they were 170 pounds, and uh, gender equality was rigorously enforced. So this woman is carrying 170 pounds as well. And remember, the, uh, there's very little level, uh, so you go walking uphill and downhill most of the time. And here's a mix of cultures for you, tennis shoes, uh, carrying the load and talking on the cell phone. It's one of the uh, pictures I'm most proud of. Lots of cell phones. Almost everybody had a cell phone. And other women hard at work. Women's traditional dress is a kira, and you can see the uh, uh, for men it's the go tied at the waist with a kira, which is a uh, a belt of this similar uh, uh, fabric. Uh, weaving is a uh, task that many women uh, many women do, and the fabrics are really quite attractive. Uh, the cuff on the men is folded back. It's white for people that, uh, for most men in formal uh, conditions, it's gold for the, uh, uh, for the royalty. Quite fashionable. This woman has a chicken on a, uh, on a leash for some reason, but she has a nice hat, beautiful head of white hair, but she's just sitting sunning herself. And this uh, is one of our uh, guides. He's dressed because we're going uh, uh, to some of the government places. He's uh, dr dressed for a formal occasion. You must, if you are going for a formal or a business occasion, you must wear traditional costume. Child immunizations is almost 100%. Bhutan has many municipal er, uh, medicinal herbs. Uh, they have a lot of them. Uh, over 300 medicines in the form of pills, tablets, syrups, and uh, powders and lotions, but they do have Western medicine as well. Uh, their life uh, expectancy is quite, uh, uh, quite reasonable. They don't have adequate records because they just started taking records. So the, really, the, there's estimates on population and where their population was uh, just a, a short time ago. But uh, 
they think that we're going through a period of rapid population growth. And the, these people were taking their newborn uh, to the doctor. And you can see they're dressed in traditional garb as well because they're going to the doctor. And this, this really, really was a newborn. And we would go birding most mornings. It was in the fog. So uh, they were listening uh, for the, the sounds rather than being able to see anything. They were saying they because I don't know the bird sounds as well as most of the uh, people I was with. But uh, semi-tropical lowlands to semi-arctic mountain peaks, uh, really a lot of variety of, of places. We went to the Black Neck Crane Information Center, or Projica, and we were with the Royal Society for the Protection of Nature, and this is, they were working uh, with the uh, International uh, Crane Foundation. And where were the Black Neck Cranes? We looked around, and uh, they were nowhere to be seen, and uh, they were supposed to be there. We came at the right time, and uh, there was none. And uh, that's George Archibald uh, with the gray uh, sweater and the green hat. And he had promised. You know, we paid our money. And uh, this is the uh, older uh, fellow that had a, a farm here. And he had, uh, for years and years, kept a diary. Uh, and. Uh, each day, he would note down how many cranes he had seen. This is way before the International Crane Foundation ever came here. And when they found out, this was a, a great resource for them. And so he's the crane man of uh, Bhutan. And uh, so they uh, uh, started paying him to, to continue to do this. And so he was talking to us, and he said, they, they will come. They will come. Just be patient. And... Uh, uh, so he gave us a little bit of a talk, and so we ate lunch, and then we laid back to, uh, uh, to have a, uh, uh, after a, a lunch, and to have a little rest, and looked up in the sky, and, and three cranes came circling down. What they do is they, they come from Tibet, and they'll find thermals. Uh, cranes don't come long distances by flapping their wings, they fly thermals, and they, they'll find a thermal, warm air rises. So when they find a thermal, which is rising warm air, they spread their wings, and they'll circle. And they'll rise as high as they can, and then they'll glide, and they'll glide down. And they'll glide as far as they can, they find another thermal, and they'll, they'll go up and up. Otherwise, they would, uh, they would tire themselves too much. And uh, so they were really high, and they circled, and they came down, down, down. And we watched them all the way down, and here they had landed. And uh, uh, so uh, we had our cranes. About 500 black neck cranes winter in Bhutan. Uh, this one's looking for some tuber, uh, tubers or waste grain or voles or insects. There are about five to 6,000 black neck cranes in the wetlands, uh, uh, in the world. Uh, in wetlands, they also eat snails, shrimp, fish, and, and frogs. The other ones uh, will either stay in Tibet in where there's some uh, uh, warm water areas, or they'll go into, uh, into China. Uh, they're about four feet tall. They're about 12 pounds. And uh, they're declining in number. They're... Uh, uh, they're vulnerable is the uh, designation that's given to them. And you can see they uh, uh, they have black uh, feathers uh, in their tail and on the neck. The red spot that you see above their, their eye, that's where they're bald because the, the skin is red. And they have the white, uh, white feathers. In Tibet, agricultural product, uh, practices have reduced uh, the waste barley and spring wheat. So they're, they're beginning to lose uh, valuable food resources. And uh, in Bhutan, these dams that are being built by the Indian uh, money that's coming in 
are uh, threatening their wetland habitat. So, uh, so they're, uh, they're becoming uh, threatened. So this is the crane festival that we were coming to. It was located at a school. And the kids had made uh, 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 posters, and uh, they were coming to attention here. And this is at Bundling. And this is the art contest that they had. And we were supposed to go and, and uh, grade the art. And the theme was the relationship between black neck cranes and the people. And uh, uh, so uh, we graded those. And here they're marching by in, uh, in parade. And there's George. George Archibald is the head of the International Crane Foundation. He's addressing the festival. And here's the local farmer, the guy who uh, kept track of the, uh, the cranes. And he had made himself a crane hat. And he addresses the festival wearing his crane mask. He was really having a good time, believe me. He liked this role. And here's the student crane dance. The thought is, is that the cranes will bring tourists and that uh, this is going to be a uh, uh, something that will make money, but it's also uh, kind of semi-religious because of the long life of the cranes. They mate uh, uh, forever. They, uh, they have a single mate, and, and there are just things that are much admired by the, uh, the people about the cranes. And there's a martial art demonstration. And then we went on to another uh, place where they were working with another uh, endangered bird. This one really endangered. Uh, the researcher, his name was Rebecca, and she was working for the San Diego Zoo. And she was uh, describing the efforts to save the white-bellied heron. It's one of the world's 50 most endangered birds. And she was saying, you know, they, they uh, nest high in the trees of the rainforest, and they nest way out in the uh, outer branches of some of the trees so that if you're going to get out into their nests, you have to really get out on the edges of the, uh, of the branches where your weight could break the branch off and it gets kind of dangerous. And uh, so they had gotten two eggs the previous year, and they succeeded in hatching one of them. And they did raise one fledgling and did successfully release that. But she said any chance of, of doing this in any numbers were really, really uh, uh, remote. And uh, there are 30 individuals left in Bhutan. There's 150 of these in the world. And uh, lo and behold, I, I came over a ridge in the, uh, on the stream, and here's a white-bellied heron. So this is my picture. I got the first picture of a, a white-bellied heron. There were only 30 individuals left in Bhutan, and there he is. And uh, so I was kind of proud of this, uh, this shot. But uh, with some of the dams that they're going to put in, one of the dams is going to uh, wreck this particular river. And so uh, the battle is on for uh, saving some of these river habitats in Bhutan. And uh, uh, the International Crane Foundation is right in the middle of it, along with their allies in, in Bhutan. And uh, they're up against big money interests and, and uh, you know, and in India, and then some of the big businessmen in Bhutan as well. So, small kingdom or not, the same, same thing goes on. This is the red-vented bobble. Around 700 species of birds in Bhutan, 84% of the species are forest species. That's the long-tailed shrike. Uh, forest Bhutan habitats for birds. For, you got the rainforest, you got scrubland, you got wetland, you got alpine, you got tropical, tropical, and you got agricultural. So no wonder there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of species here. 
uh, because it, for a very tiny country, uh, your your uh, uh, your uh, different kind of habitats are, are incredibly varied. Uh, you have about 50, uh, 55 species that migrate from the north during the winter and and just come down and and uh, for part of the year and then go back north again. Whoop. This is a, ch a Chinese moral pheasant. It's one of the largest mono, uh, one of the largest monos. Uh, just happened to uh, see one uh, kind of resting in the uh, in the grass. Iridescent. I mean, it was really beautiful relative to the turkey. This is an American teacher in his go, and he was uh, 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 teaching on an uh, exchange program in one of the schools, and that's one of our guides. All the students in, uh, in the schools are taught English. Uh, of course, that shouldn't be surprising because uh, India and Bhutan, along with it, were uh, English uh, colony at one point. And when uh, the English left India, uh, uh, they left Bhutan as well. And uh, India kind of uh, took over the guidance of Bhutan from the English. Uh, but Bhutan established an independence, but it still has this uh, guidance uh, uh, from India that uh, is a holdover from the English uh, uh, period. But the young generation, you know, just think these, uh, these uh, young people are facing problems, uh, technology that they're learning. They really are coming from a, a very basic uh, background of... Uh, t basic technology to facing, uh, you know, the uh, cell phones are there, the television, the uh, things that they're seeing in other countries and, and uh, the, the, what they're using. And now all of a sudden there's India and China, diplomacy and, and conflict and, and uh, all these things they have to learn about and the world is speeding up. And uh, uh, these kids are all going to have part of that. Isolated kingdom, no more. Eighty percent uh, attend elementary school, drops to fifty-five percent when you get to secondary school. So there's still work to be done there too. This is a zong, which is a fortified uh, monastery, but also an administrative center. Uh, this was built in 1637. The fifth king, the current king, was married there. If one of the current dam proposals goes through, this will be flooded. This will be destroyed. Oop. This is the Dong Zong in the countryside. They are located in uh, different districts, kind of beautiful places. And this is the tiger's nest, or the tiger's lair. It's at 10,200 feet, built onto a, a sheer cliff. Perched on a two, almost 3,000 foot uh, sheer cliff. And of course, you have to go up there. Hiking up to the tiger's nest. You can see the, uh, uh, the trail, diagonal. It's about a two and a half hour hike at high altitude. The Guru Rinpoche, who is the one who brought Buddhism to, uh, to uh, uh, Bhutan, flew there on a tigress uh, and defeated a local demon. He was cheating. He flew there. Uh, the rest of us had to walk. But uh, he, uh, he's the one who brought Buddhism to Bhutan. And it's a Tibetan kind of Buddhism. A chorten is kind of a stupa, if you're familiar with uh, uh, Buddhism. Uh, it houses the relics of the Buddha and sacred texts. And this is the Kora chorten. And uh, they're built in places of spiritual power to ward off evil spirits. The 
the legend of this one is that there is a 13-year-old girl who was sacrificed and is, uh, is entombed here in this one. It's a special, uh, powerful chordon that people make uh, uh, pilgrimages to and they make circumambulations around it, seven times clockwise around it, is, uh, is something that gives you a really good karma. And uh, so people come from long distances to do that. And you can get your Chorton souvenir here. Bhutan, uh, Bhutan Buddhism uh, is Vayurama. It's, uh, you, you try to get your Buddha nature as a Buddhist, Bodhisattva. You, you, you uh, try to see reality as it really is, but you stay here and become a good person that tries to uh, get other people to see existence as it really is. And here's the Guru, Guru Rinpoche. Uh, he stopped here to spread Buddhism in Bhutan. Picture of him. That's the interior of a monastery, place where the Buddhist uh, monks will uh, uh, sit in lotus position, memorize their, their Buddha texts. And there's a Buddha text. There are about 12,000 Buddhist monks in Bhutan. Those are the robes that they would be wearing. And he's memorizing on his smartphone, apparently. Even the monks, this is really disappointing, even the monks have a smartphone. And these are the novice monks, the young ones, memorizing texts and having a good time. And here they're playing cricket and lots of noise and lots of laughter on their time off. Of course, British. And they endure the distractions of modern life. Here there's... There's a large prayer wheel behind that you would push on paddles and it would turn. And she has her prayer beads. There's 108 prayer beads signifying the desires of mankind. And as you go through them, you deny them. And clockwise circumambulation of the monastery reciting the three jewels of the Buddhism, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and you get rid of the mortal desires of man, clear your mind, and all your desires empty out, and all that's left is empty of desire, and then all you see is God. And here's a monk walking around the exterior of the monastery early in the morning, cleansing the monastery of evil spirits. And as older people face death, it's merely part of the cycle leading to rebirth, samsara. The average life expectancy is about 70 years. And this is really cool. This is archery, is the Bhutanese national sport. And uh, they use both the really highly sophisticated bows and then their, their old style uh, bamboo bowls that they, uh, they have. Whoops. But I don't know if you can see way down, way, way down there, the people standing around, just like they are here. But you see the piece of wood here? On this side, by the red and the yellow, there's a little marker on there that's the target. And they come remarkably close. And they stand really close to that piece of wood. And uh, they shoot back and forth. And then there's a crowd there, just if you miss, they hoot and holler at you. And if you come close, they really cheer. These guys are really good. They are really good. And if you're a monk, you're not allowed to be an archer. It's just like the medieval monks couldn't uh, uh, kill with a sword. So then they hit you over the head with a mace, you know, with the uh, spikes on it. Well, you couldn't uh, shoot a bow and arrow, but you could throw a dart. 
And that's what these uh, guys are doing. And at a distance of 66 feet, that's a dart. And it could do some damage as well. And this uh, is Chinese Viagra. It's a cordyceps. It's a, it's a fungus that grows on a caterpillar at high altitude. And it kills the caterpillar. And people go in search of this because it is worth so much money. Chinese will pay lots of money for this. And uh, uh, the Chinese have been coming over the border, and the Bhutanese are really angry about this because uh, uh, the, the caterpillar species is going extinct because of this. But uh, uh, it's a cancer medicine. It's an athletic performance enhancer. Yeah, but mainly, it's a it's a Viagra for the Chinese, and uh, uh, it's, they're getting conflicts in the high altitude mountains on the border with China, and uh, it's really becoming an international incident between uh, China and Bhutan. Amazing. You grind it up and then you eat it. And the mad monk Drupka Kunle was really hungry when he came to this village. And so he said, I'm so hungry, feed me. So they gave him a goat, and he ate the goat, and then he ate a cow. And then he uh, was satisfied, and then he took the bones and he put them together, and he put the, the uh, uh, skull of the goat back on the, uh, the skeleton of the cow, and ended up with this. It's called a takin, and that's, uh, that's one of the national animals of uh, Bhutan. It's called a takin. That's our explanation for the animal. And the golden langur. Kind of a beautiful animal. Bhutanese uh, house. They live on the second floor, and the other floors, the bottom was for animals, basically, and the upper floor is for storage. Always an altar room. It's cutting silage beside there. I don't know if you can notice the wheel has a scythe or a, a cutting thing, and he's cutting hay. And then the corn up on top. It's chopping silage. And this is an upper class house, so the beautiful artwork. And freehand artwork. So what's going to be done for, you know, this is jarring. This is a Buddhist a temple with a prayer wheel that means peace. And uh, here you have a Bhutanese soldier. Uh, you have uh, a peaceful kingdom, gross national happiness. And then you have a soldier with his rifle. You have uh, India and China competing for world power. And you've got this little kingdom. And uh, you know it's just such uh, jarring. Uh, uh, juxtapositions, it's, it's really difficult to deal with. And here's a young boy that uh, caught skipping school. And, uh, you know, how well are they going to be the young generation to deal with all this? It's, uh, it's really uh, a hard to fathom. And uh, it's their schooling, I think, isn't quite adequate for the, for the job. Uh, this gross national happiness uh, uh, philosophy that they they were talking about. The new prime minister said, "Now we're really not ready for it." Uh, you know, it was uh, Prime Minister Thinley uh, thought it up, and it was really a good idea. But we don't have the money. We don't. Uh, uh, we can't practice it ourselves because uh, we we can't put it into practice. And uh, so, where where does Bhutan go? Uh, are they going to build the big dams? Are they going to wreck their nature? Is, are they going to go the rest of the way toward modernization? 
you know, there's so many questions. My advice is to pack your bags tomorrow and go to Bhutan before it's, it's gone. So that's Bhutan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. We've got time for a few questions before we move into uh, the dining area. So I can take some questions now, and then, as usual, we'll do them uh, during dessert time. So, yes, right here, Dick Lipinski. Uh, Rick, yeah. what leverage does India and China, just because of their, because of their size, is that how they have leverage to do these uh, dams in Bhutan? Because they, they don't, obviously don't respect the sovereignty of another country if you're telling us that they're going to build the dams in Bhutan. Bhutan has a high rate of debt. If they want to do any, their government wants to do anything, uh, they need money. Oh, okay. Where is the money going to come from? Uh, their businessmen are inexperienced. Their government is inexperienced. Uh, they're Advisors come from India. <laughs> China is trying to advise them. U.S. is trying to advise them. John. Sounds like they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. What, what's that? No, I, I saw a lot of water. Is there much fishing there? I didn't see any fishing there, but there sure should be. The water, water should be really, really, really clean and fast moving. There should be great fishing there. I didn't see any going on. Um, right here. How difficult was it to get permission to visit Bhutan? I mean, did you have to apply special visas or anything like that, Rick? Or Well, the, the International Crane Foundation took care of it. Uh, they allow about 100,000 visitors a year. So as long as you get your application in, uh, I think you have to go through an approved uh, group visit. I don't know that you have to, how much individual traveling there is. Uh, there's not a lot of hotel space in eastern Bhutan. We uh, would split up into a lot of different unofficial B&Bs. Uh, people who agreed to house us as a uh, as member of, the, of this expedition. Uh, in Western uh, Bhutan, there, was, there were hotels and, uh, of various sizes, nothing real big. Uh, the TV, Rick, is that uh, the government's station or is it commercial or what is it? I did tell you the truth, I didn't watch much about it. I think it was Indian, India. Uh, I'm trying to remember if I saw any. I think it was mainly uh, cricket matches, <laughs> cricket matches uh, and stuff like that. And, uh, but there was some English, uh, English language stuff because that's, you know, that would cover the whole country. There's three different languages in different areas. Uh, there is the Nepalese language. There's another language in the central part of the country. And then there's uh, uh, kind of the Bhutanese type of language. So English is the, is the one that covers the whole country. Everybody's taught English. Did most of the people seem short to you? Short? Yeah, shorter than me, yes. Yeah, yeah. No. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I got a feeling it had to be, I don't know. Where the cell towers were. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick.